get to where we, now is this to be written on low? Yes. Is it? Yes. <laughs> well, I want to be sure that you pronounce some of the main characters' names properly. For instance, Al Yosha. See? Al Yosha. Now that is the Russian E. So it, it would be Alexei in, in, if we anglicized it. But they make the E into a Yo sound. And so don't call him Theodore. But Fyodor. Fyo. See, so try to do that because no doubt you'll be talking about these characters a great deal in the next few weeks. And so you want to pronounce their names properly. I think those are the ones that we have. You'll have most trouble remembering to do right. But don't say Fyodor. <laughs> it's Fyodor. All right, the novel that we are studying this evening, The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky's final writing, is by most people thought to be his best. He died soon after it was completed. It represents in many ways the culmination of his achievement, the high point of his vision, that toward which he'd been struggling for most of his life. And I think you can see some of the same characters and types and situations that you had in the earlier works. Now the goal of a poet, and by the word poet, I mean the maker of fictions. This is what Aristotle, uh, how he distinguished, you know, between the writer of ideas and the writer of fictions is he called him a maker and that's what that word poet meant and so whether he's a novelist or uh, a lyric poet or an epic poet we ought to be able to call them all poets if they are makers of fictions so we could say then that the poet has a goal if he's serious, and he keeps trying to get at that figure in the carpet, as Henry James called it, uh, that pattern in his mind that keeps troubling him. And I think you can see from having read the Dostoevsky novels that the figure in the carpet uh, is there. Uh, it's like a, a subdued pattern that maybe the large pattern obscures. But if you study it, you can see that figure that he's concerned with. Caroline Gordon, the novelist that we had here on campus for about seven years, uh, Alan Tate's wife, the poet Alan Tate, was married to Caroline Gordon. She had written 11 important novels, and she said, my stories are all one story. I keep telling it over and over again. And I think we can see that with Dostoevsky, that the characters are similar to each other, though they change with each situation, the plot, that figure that he's trying to get at. And so we have to try to decide what we think he is doing. What is his life work? What is that myth, as I would call it, that lies behind what he shows us with each plot. Now, I don't think Dostoevsky's aim is simply to emulate the New Testament, though he uses that kind of style, but he's not trying to make Christians of us. That's not his job. Rather, it seems to me he's struggling to bring back into existence or to keep alive something that he considers natural to human beings. Something without which we're not quite human. And I would call that a piety and a love.
toward our membership in the human race. It seems to me this is what he is attempting over and over again to depict that pietas that people used to have. They used to love the people that they belonged to and the nation and the country and the land, the earth. The Romans called it pietas, but we have little understanding of it today. The modern has only scorn for such a feeling. But Dostoevsky would have us see that we reach an understanding of subornos, that we are not just individuals, we belong to each other. We're kin to each other, we're related to each other. So we reach an understanding of subornos, of what it is to be part of the mystical body, only by recreating in our own lives what he calls a love of holy Russia. So. We have to pretend when we're reading these novels that Russia is native to us and that we love it too. Now this is not an intellectual matter. It can't be proved that we should love our family or our school or our town or our country or the human race. But Dostoevsky would have it that this ladder of analogy you know, you start with the thing that's nearest you, and then you go on up. And you should be bound to all of it, you know, by love and piety and loyalty and fidelity. So this ladder of analogy is necessary to us if we're to love it all and not to get lost in dreams. You see, the people who don't have this kind of piety and love for the actual get lost in love and dreams. They want to reform the human race. They want to clean it up and then they'll love it. See, And so I think this may be the main thing that Dostoevsky is showing us. This is what the Lady of Little Faith expresses, Madame Holocaust. She says how hard it is to love people that are near you. You know, you can love people in the abstract. You know, and I once had a student who was very, he was a blue-eyed idealist, and he stood up one day and said, I'd die on a hill for mankind, you know, but I can't stand people. <laughs> and so, and so I think that's, that's a modern ailment, and Dostoevsky is showing us that in the character of Ivan and some of the others that he wrote about. Now, when we are t attempting then to get at what's behind a single piece of writing, I think we try to see the very tone and form of it. So when I talk about his using a carnivalistic style or polyphonic or any of those things, I'm not simply pointing out just an artistic method, but it's a method of getting at truth. It's a method of expressing what it is that he wants to say. Poetry is the most effective way for language to communicate a truth as it's lived in life and not simply thought about. See. So Dostoevsky's unique style and method need to be noticed for they govern the implications of what he says. As some of the new critics insisted, form is meaning. See, something would be different if it were said. Its meaning would be different if it were said differently. And we know that in life. You know, if someone says to you, I really do love you, you know, then you want to know how much irony is in that. You know, are they being sarcastic? You know, and you, you listen and sometimes many quarrels, uh, domestic quarrels come about simply because of tone of voice, you know. And so we know that meaning is changed by the form in which it appears. The shape of the medieval cathedral, for instance, versus the shape of the Parthenon, you know, makes it a very different kind of statement of meaning. And the grossness of a film like Brokeback Mountain, compared with the subtleties of, say, something like the station agent, 
or even if we want a popular film, as good as it gets. And that was a good film. But it seems to me that the form of Brokeback Mountain, the whole the photography, the form, all of it, uh, was just not very good. And it wasn't the theme or the content that I'm speaking about. So I think we do feel, and we are aware, and you may disagree with me, certainly. I was saying all that to be shocking. But, <laughs> but you know that when you love a film, it's because of the way it's done. You know, it isn't just the statement that it makes. It isn't just the ideas, but it's the way it's done, the way it's put together, uh, the remarkable uniqueness of it. And so when we talk about Dostoevsky's uniqueness of form and style and content and tone, then we're talking about meaning, or we mean to. So as we say, after long examination of an author's work, we can see something of the figure in the carpet, the myth behind the plots and characters, and the large meta-story that gives form and substance to the various versions that are represented in the individual works. So how would we say what Dostoevsky's figure in the carpet is? What is his myth? Well, first of all, let's say that his writing is epic in form and substance. Now, novels are inherently epic. This means that the greatest novels are ultimately about the health of a culture, the fulfillment of a people's destiny. See, the, the work that people make together. What a culture is, is a people's work of art, something they construct together. So if epics are concerned with a whole people's culture, and comedies are concerned with the health of the community and the city, and tragedy with the oikos, the family, the household, and the city, and lyric with the psyche and the beloved, you see, that's, we can see the epic is the broadest scope of the genres, and that in scope it's always concerned with the whole society out of which it comes. Now these statements are of course overgeneralizations, but they help us to discern tendencies in the various kinds as Aristotle spoke of them. He spoke of the kinds as tragedy, comedy, epic, and then the music of the lyre, the lyric. Now, Dostoevsky's work is epic. It's comic in tone. It's grotesque, as we've said, iconic, polyphonic. But the underground stream in it moves forward, concerned always with the destiny of Holy Russia, its mission in the world. Now, this incidentally seems to be the concern of the greatest writers, Moses as the author of Exodus, Homer, Virgil, Dante, Shakespeare, Melville, Dostoevsky, Faulkner, Garcia Marquez are concerned with that movement forward of a whole people. So Dostoevsky's attempt in his most serious writings, then the figure in his carpet, produced recurring sketches of the way in which a people whose culture is thrown off balance may gradually right itself and continue the path toward its destiny. His novels are what physicists would call heuristic devices. You know, devices in which you try something in order to ascertain a truth. You construct a heuristic device to try to find out something. And so it seems to me that Dostoevsky is constantly trying to find out something. It isn't that he starts out just with propaganda that he wants to express, but he has a, di a, a dim idea of what it is that he wants to get at 
and it's hard to get at it. But by the time he does, it seems to me that just as we trust the experience, the experiments of scientists, we ought to trust these experiments because they are made with qualities of things rather than quantities. But I think they are in their own way true. So the myth of Holy Russia for Dostoevsky was the topic for his art to investigate. What happens to Sobornost in the wake of modernity? What happens to the mystical unity that binds a people into one body? Can a branch be cut off from the tree and live? Now the New Testament tells us otherwise. And what happens to the tree itself when its major branches have been sheared away? So the myth of Holy Russia might be said to be that of, if we wanted to describe it, of a czar father who represents wisdom and sacred authority and the earth mother guiding a young hero who shows nobility and courage and spurred on for his love for a beautiful woman, he leads the people into truth and justice. Their suffering, aiding, and in some sense, saving the rest of the world. Now that's a slightly different myth from the myth of the West, because the myth of the West is about success. It's about leading a people into success. Excuse me. I still have my hoarseness. I wish I could pick that up. So think about that, that there's an authority figure that they, they tied that authority with the czar. And they thought of the czar as benevolent. And then they tied that in with the earth mother, with a young hero, like Igor, you know, Prince Igor, who through his love for a beautiful woman then leads a people into truth and justice, but he doesn't necessarily win the war. And suffering is the real action that Dostoevsky, representing the Russians, felt was efficacious. So Dostoevsky began investigating his myth with notes from underground in which the intellect is portrayed as embittered, protesting social propaganda, hiding itself underground, and behaving in an antisocial and sometimes despicable manner in order to proclaim its freedom. And Raskolnikov then, in Crime and Punishment, continues this figure of the underground man, killing an old woman, primarily to proclaim his own freedom and strength, saved by the suffering image of grace and wisdom, the prostitute, Sonia. Now notice that fathers are missing in those two works. So something has happened to the masculine principle, you see, in Russia in the 19th century. Raskolnikov's doting mother, in fact, is one of the forces that goad him into committing the murder. And Sonia's father is an alcoholic. We leave Raskolnikov in Siberia at hard labor, his heart turned, however, by Sonia, who has followed him into exile. And then we go on to the idiot. I'm trying to sum up this whole um, myth that's behind Dostoevsky's work because this is his culminating work that we're studying this evening. <coughs> the idiot tries out the reanimation of an ideal before Christianity. It seems to me that the Prince Mishkin is a pre-Christian figure. Tries out the figure of the spiritual man who does not understand suffering and imperfection, but who, like an angel, pities and is somewhat repelled by mortality. Can you turn that up a little? 
whatever its intentions at the outset, the idiot finds that the ideal of perfection, sorry, does violence to actual human beings and results in the death of the beauty that is inherent in a people's soul. So at the end, when Nastasha is dead, something is gone out of the whole Russian soul, at least for a while, as Dostoevsky seems to indicate. Whether Dostoevsky knew it or not, virtue is not the aim of the spiritual life as it is of the classical ideal. But that reality and that beauty and that love that we've always associated with the figure of a beautiful woman seems to be the spiritual ideal. And the dream of innocence that Mishkin advances doesn't lead a people into anything profitable. And then the devils takes the hero figure even further, making of him a pseudo-messiah, Stavrogin, fulfilling everyone's hopes, or so it's planned. Dostoevsky, along with his younger friend, the philosopher Soloviev, call this figure an antichrist, one who seems to embody the highest virtues and who promises salvation, being all things to all men, but hollow in himself. And the lovely lady is split into many parts, so we see her in many guises in the devils. All of them recognizing in Stavrogin the image of the hero, but disappointed in his actuality. He himself, knowing his falsity, commits suicide out of a kind of altruism, taking himself out of the picture so that he cannot be used as the figure of a messiah. Now at the end of the devils, all the heresies are killed off. The mad girl, a kind of deranged image at once of the Blessed Mother and the rich Russian soil. Another Mary, whose Joseph, Shatov, is brutally murdered and who dies herself, along with an infant who might have provided hope. So the movement in the devils is downward, but it is clearing the air, it's clearing the field, so that there can be a new start. Because we see the Russian intellectuals out of whom the devils have come, the wrong ideas that have misled the young. We see them represented in Stepan Verkovinsky, the older generation, the teacher, who has repented at the end and purged, comes to the foot of the cross before he dies. But left at the end of that novel are the little people, you know, none of the heroic ones are left. We're, we have the ones who follow the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, the meek, those that mourn, those that hunger and thirst, the pure in heart, that show mercy, that are calumniated. So these are the suffering servants of whom Isaiah speaks, Dasha, the gospel woman, and even Barbara, and the narrator, Anton. So society has to start over at the end of the devils, building on the least powerful of its members. So in the Brothers Karamazov, we have Dostoevsky's final novel, his masterpiece, which takes up all his themes and reorganizes them into a totally different action, a world that has to be interpreted on its own. You know, because he's not writing sequels you know, it's not that these novels are sequels to each other. He's writing separate works of art. But I think we can see the way in which that story, that one story, that figure in the carpet, as I've been calling it, along with Henry James, uh, the way that persists in his imagination. So those of us who have read the other major works can't help seeing dimly in the background then 
this Russian myth tried for one last time with a much more affirmative outcome. But Dostoevsky is not to be sure, as we say, of uh, just picking up where he left off and going on from there. He starts over every time. And in the Brothers Karamazov, in the town named Skoroprigonetsk, which means, in one translation, means pig pen, there's the flawed, fallible, and ambiguous past. The biological father, old Karamasa, the buffoon, with two sides to him. And there's the other spiritual patriarch. So it's as though he's telling us we have two fathers as members of the human race. We have the old man that St. Paul tells us must die. You know, the old man is flawed and sinful. And then there is the other father, the spiritual father, Father Zosima. There are three sons, one passionate, like Rogozhin, except made a bit more polished and presentable in Dmitri. There's the bright young intellectual, Ivan, who like the underground man, Raskolnikov, and like Ippolit and Peter, on the one hand, and like Mishkin and Stavrogin on the other, is a thinker whose mind is distorted by the abstract teachings of the West. And then there's Alyosha, who is another try at whatever Dostoevsky was attempting in The Idiot. But Alyosha is quite different from Mishkin. And we'll talk about him in just a moment. And then there's the proud young lady, Katerina, who has her precursors in Aglaya and Lisa. There's the full-bodied Russian beauty, Grushenka, who symbolizes the earth. And we see her preceded in his writings by Nastasha and, oddly enough, Sonia of Crime and Punishment. So think about these figures and the way in which they recur and how different uh, his treatment is of them in this novel. So the characters wind in and out among each other, but each in his this final novel has become a separate person in his or her own right. And the meta story is given another chance at working itself out and ending happily. You see, because none of those novels really ended happily. He added an epilogue on the crime and punishment with happiness somewhere in the future because Raskolnikov and Sonia will marry but they're not happy immediately because he is still in Siberia. So look at the title, The Brothers Karamaza. Each brother, a part of a whole. If we simplified it, we could say there's a body, a mind, and a soul with Dmitri being the body, Ivan the mind, and Alyosha the soul. But that's meant to touch it just briefly. We aren't meant to allegorize it that much. But the last two, the body and the, no, the mind and the soul have the same mother. And her name is Sophia, which means wisdom. So the thing we need to do when we think of the destiny of Yvonne, the intellectual, is to remember that his mother, Sophia, is the saint, the holy fool, who bore Ayosha. She was my mother too, Yvonne says at one point, rather hotly, because people think of her just as Ayosha's mother. Now the father has used up his son's inheritance as one generation tends to do to another. And this is the moment when the bill is due. The sons come home to collect. Even Adyosha has come home to claim something that is his heritage, his mother. You know, he's thought about her all his life. He 
has a few memories of her, and he's thought about her, and he's come home to find her grave. But it's the eldest, Dimitri, who's been cheated out of his inheritance, and it's he now who must, must, most needs funds to maintain his honor because he has an obligation to Katerina Ivanovna. And he's tied to Katerina Ivanovna by his pride, and he is tied to Grushinka by his heart. And so he is a man torn in two. Now why has Ivan come home? I don't think the novel tells us that, really. Is it just out of sympathy for Dmitri? They don't really know each other. Is it that Yvonne specs an inheritance too? But it's at this crucial moment that all three sons come home. Alyosha to look for his mother's grave, Dmitri to claim the land that he thinks is his, and Yvonne thinking that perhaps there's some inheritance that he's to gain. Now the story shows us in Yvonne, the pride and self-centeredness on which aristocratic nobility is based, because Yvonne is an aristocrat in spirit. Now look at what the narrator says there at the beginning. Read that beginning. Turn to that passage, it says, from the author. He says, in beginning the life story of my hero, Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov, I find myself in somewhat of a quandary. Namely, although I call Alexei Fyodorovich my hero, I myself know that he's by no means a great man. And hence I foresee such unavoidable questions as these. What's so remarkable about your Alexei Fyodorovich that you have chosen him as your hero? What has he accomplished? What is he known for and by whom? Why should I, the reader, waste time learning the facts of his life? I say this, the author declares, because unhappily I anticipate it. I can only say that for me, he is remarkable. He goes on to admit that Adyosha is odd, even eccentric, and an eccentric is always a separate element. Isn't that so? Now, if you do not agree with this last thesis and answer, it isn't so, or it isn't always so, then I, if you please, might become encouraged about the significance of my hero, Alexei Fyodorovich. For not only is an eccentric not always a particularity and a separate element, but on the contrary, it happens sometimes that such a person, I dare say, carries within himself the very heart of the whole, and the rest of the men of his epoch have for some reason been temporarily torn from it, as if by a gust of wind. Now this introduces what we call a fallible narrator, one who seems timid and admits he's not entirely certain of his success but who obviously has something in mind. Alyosha is his hero, because the epic hero became so far removed from the right ideals that an eccentric is nearer the center. An eccentric means out of the center. So we have the paradox that someone who's not in the center of the society is the center of it. Now this should have quashed all the commentary that over the years made Ivan the doubter, the hero, because that's been the dominant uh, approach of scholars up until very recently, that Ivan is the hero. And it's simply because people like doubters better in our day <laughs> than they like believers. And the movie, if you saw that old awful movie, you know, with Yul Brynner as Dmitri, um, Alyosha was just turned into an Arab boy. You know, there wasn't any part for him except to carry a message from one to the other. So they didn't see that Alyosha was the hero at all. 
Now the narrator is a careful person, one who has observed the events that occurred in Skoropryunevsk and has taken them to heart, has found meaning in them, and 13 years later writes about them. That's how long it was. Richard Prevere, who has made a new translation of the brothers that has received warm critical reviews, stresses the importance of this narrator. He says, by making this narrator a writer, and a writer with such pronounced personal mannerisms, Dostoevsky stresses the writtenness of the novel. And you're going to see a great deal of that writtenness, that quality of being written in it. But perhaps unexpectedly, Puvier says, this has the effect of heightening the reality of the events and the people that he's writing about, of detaching them somewhat from the world. And he goes on to say, there is no absolute authorial voice in the Brothers Karamazov. Every scene is narrated from at least some particular perspective. And where the narrator seems effaced, we find that his voice has shaded into the equally distinct verbal elements of the characters that he's describing. So usually we're aware of the author's, the narrator's voice, but where it's effaced and we don't, can't pick it out, it's because he's shaded into the scene, but he's there all the time. Now looking for clues to the direction of the novel, we've looked at what the author, from the author, and that author is the narrator the fictional narrator. Then where else do we look? We looked at the title. Then I think we have to read the epigraph, which is verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now that's from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, the 34th verse. I think you will see that pattern throughout the novel. I think you will see each of the brothers fall to the earth and die. And the question is whether they will bring forth fruit or not. Now Dostoevsky has here given us a quite definite sign concerning the action of the novel. It's about falling to the earth and dying and bringing forth fruit. Now this pattern will be carried out in all three of the brothers' lives. All of them will have to be in effect destroyed. All three will have to be remade, even the hero, the innocent Alyosha, that we think at first is so much like Mishkin, but he's really not like Mishkin. So the novel is about rebirth and regeneration and resurrection. It's about life again after death, the great theme of literature. But not only life again after death, but it's about crucifixion, suffering, suffering unto death. This falling to the earth implies death to the old self, giving up the narrowness of egotistical illusion and becoming something quite different in order to submit to the totality of creation its grace and its purpose. And so what we have is that theme that Dante wrote about so eloquently, La Vita Nuova, the new life. Now, the Brothers Karamazov is arguably one of the great literary works of the world. Its symmetry out of apparent asymmetry, its order out of chaos, its architectonic unity out of episodic structure, its simplicity derived from complexity, everything moving, not static, 
place it beside the Divine Comedy. It enlarges the range of experience usually treated in the novel, but it maintains the genre's essential skepticism. The novel always has to have somebody's word for something. You see, it can't quite do what um, other what a, a long poem can do. You see, it can't just speak directly. But the novel has to give you hearsay or some kind of evidence because it was born in the time of modernity. And we want proof. You see, we seem to demand some kind of real evidence in the novel. You need to look, if you're working on the novel any time, you really need to look at um, that classic book by Lukash, L-U-K-A-C-S, called Theory of the Novel. And though I think it has been supplanted by later works, still this is kind of the classic work in talking about how novels began. So the Brothers Karamazov enlarges the range of experience that is usually treated in the novel, but it maintains the genre's essential skepticism. The narrator says, some say this, and he pretends ignorance. And we figure that he's made up some of the evidence because he's given himself to it and understands what's going on. But he never speaks as an omniscient writer. He's a human being who has witnessed all of this. And so this novel manages to convey a speculation about things that are ordinarily hidden from sight and those taking place in the human spirit. And Dostoevsky referred to this technique as the higher realism. This novel, his last one, written shortly before he died, then is, shows his mastery of this technique. But though it's been praised from the beginning, it's been cited chiefly for its parts. You know, for the characters, for the dynamic excitement of it, people haven't looked at the unity of this novel. And so I think that is our task when we study it, is to see what it's really about and how it crowns all the writings that we've read of his before. All right, it's themes. There are many of them. It's about money. It's about miracles. It's about memory, obedience, the elders, the holy fool, buffoons and mad women, icons and the demonic, father-son relations, atheism, active love, death. These themes, the major ones of the novel, are introduced in the first two books. Now when the old man heard that his first wife had died, you know, some say that he ran about in the streets rejoicing, and others say he wept. And your author says it's probable that he did both, you know, because we are all made up of paradoxes. And he draws us in there at the very beginning. You know, first he's showing how uh, inconsistent the old man is. Sorry. And then he says, we are too. So we both rejoice and mourn at the same time. And so we're given an extremely interesting and strange character in this old man who is so disgusting in so many ways and yet so witty and sharp, you know, that we can't keep from admiring him at times. 
And speaking of that second wife that he took then, he says, those innocent eyes slit my soul up like a razor. And in a man so depraved, this might, of course, mean no more than sensual attraction, as he had received no dowry with his wife and had, so to speak, taken her from the halter. He did not stand on ceremony with her, making her feel that she had wronged him. He took advantage of her phenomenal meekness and her submissiveness to trample on the elementary decencies of marriage. He gathered loose women into his house, and he carried on orgies of debauchery in his wife's presence. To show what a past things had come to, I may mention that Grigory, the gloomy, stupid, obstinate, argumentative servant, who had always hated his first mistress, Adelaida, took the side of his new mistress. He championed her cause, abusing Fyodor Pavlovich in a manner little befitting a servant, and on one occasion broke up the revels and drove all the disorderly women out of the house. In the end, this unhappy young woman, kept in terror from her childhood, fell into that kind of nervous disease which is most frequently found in peasant women. She's not a peasant woman, but she has this disease that we're told later on that peasant women suffer from because they're made to bear so much that's unbearable. And the peasant women are said to be possessed by devils. And so this is Alyosha's mother then, and some people think she's possessed. At times, after terrible fits of hysterics, she even lost her reason, yet she bore Fyodor's two sons, Ivan and Alexei, the eldest in the first year of marriage and the second three years later. When she died, little Alexei was in his fourth year, and strange as it seems, I know, now here's the narrator, strange as it seems, I know that he remembered his mother all his life, like a dream of course. At her death, almost exactly the same thing happened to the two little boys as to their elder brother, Mitya. They were completely forgotten and abandoned by their father. They were looked after by the same Grigory and lived in his cottage, where they were found by the tyrannical old lady who had brought up their mother. She was still alive and had not all those eight years forgotten the insult done her. All that time she was obtaining exact information as to her Sophia's manner of life. This is the woman that had mistreated uh, the mother of Alyosha. And hearing of her illness and hideous surroundings, she declared aloud two or three times to her retainers, it serves her right. God has punished her for her ingratitude. Exactly three months after Sophia Ivanovna's death, the general's widow suddenly appeared in our town and went straight to Fyodor Pavlovich's house. She spent only half an hour in the town, but she did a great deal. It was evening. Fyodor Pavlovich, whom she had not seen for those eight years, came in to her drunk. And the story is that instantly upon seeing him, without any sort of explanation, she gave him two good resounding slaps on the face seized him by a tuft of hair, and shook him three times up and down. Then without a word, she went straight to the cottage to the two boys. Seeing at the first glance that they were unwashed and in dirty linen, she promptly gave Gregory, too, a box on the ear. So there is our ambiguity of human beings, because she was cruel to the mother of Alyosha. She mistreated Sonia. And yet when she hears of how she was treated here and how these two boys have been treated, she is indignant and she slaps the face of Fyodor and boxes Grigory's ears. Now the author is going to tell us a great deal about Alyosha. If you'll turn to page 13, near the top of the page. He says, I've mentioned already, by the way, that though he lost his mother in his fourth year, he remembered her all his life. 
Her face, her caresses, as though she stood living before me. Now this novel talks about memory so many times. And it tells us that one good memory can save us. You know, we don't have to have a lot of good memories, just one. Such memories may persist, as everyone knows, from an even earlier age, even from two years old, but scarcely standing out through a whole lifetime, like spots of light out of darkness, like a corner torn out of a huge picture, which has all faded and disappeared except that fragment. That's how it was with him. He remembered one still summer evening an open window, the slanting rays of the setting sun. That he recalled most vividly of all. In a corner of the room, the holy image, before it a lighted lamp, and on her knees before the image, his mother, sobbing hysterically with cries and moans, snatching him up in both arms, squeezing him close till it hurt, and praying for him to the mother of God, holding him out in both arms to the image, as though for her protection. Is it making too much noise? Well, sorry. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's too loud over here. I'm so sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Down just a little bit. Well, I'm sorry. I'm so hoarse. Can everybody in the back hear all right? Can, Can you, you hear? Okay. And suddenly a nurse runs in and snatches him from her in terror. So there's your picture. You see the holy icon, the mad woman. The woman that is mad from grief and mistreatment with her baby, her little boy, and she holds him up to the holy icon as though to put him under the mother's protection. And he remembers the slanting rays of the sun, you know, coming in and illuminating the whole scene. That was the picture. And Adyosha remembered his mother's face at that minute. He used to say that it was frenzied but beautiful, as he remembered, but he rarely cared to speak of this memory to anyone. In his childhood and youth, he was by no means expansive, and he talked little, indeed, but not from shyness or a sullen unsociability, quite the contrary, from something different, from a sort of inner preoccupation, entirely personal and unconcerned with other people, but so important to him that he seemed, as it were, to forget others on account of it. But he was fond of people. He seemed throughout his life to put implicit trust in people, yet no one ever looked on him as a simpleton or a naive person. There was something about him which made one feel at once, and it was so all his life afterwards, that he did not care to be a judge of others, that he would never take it upon himself to criticize and would never condemn anyone for anything. He seemed indeed to accept everything without the least condemnation, though often grieving bitterly. And this was so much so that no one could surprise or frighten him even in his earliest youth. Coming at 20 to his father's house, which was a very sink of filthy debauchery, he, chaste and pure as he was, simply withdrew in silence when to look on was unbearable, but without the slightest sign of contempt or condemnation. Now, I want you to be in your mind comparing him with Mishkin, because there are many conscious, many comparisons that Dostoevsky must have been conscious of making. This boy, Alyosha, has no understanding of money, just as Mishkin doesn't. If you gave him money, it would be spent quickly because it's not valuable to him. 
he's guileless. He doesn't judge others. You know, and so at first it seems as though he is very much like Michigan. But it's the work of the whole novel to make us see that he's not like Michigan. Not at all. And so this is our first real introduction to him, this passage that we're reading now. His father, who had once been in a dependent position and so was sensitive and ready to take offense, met him at first with distrust and sullenness. He does not say much, he used to say, and thinks the more. But soon, within a fortnight indeed, he took to embracing him and kissing him terribly often with drunken tears. So the old man loves him. And the old man feels this boy can save him. With sottish sentimentality, yet he evidently felt a real and deep affection for him, such as he had never been capable of feeling for anyone before. Not long after visiting his mother's grave, Alyosha suddenly announced that he wanted to enter the monastery and that the monks were willing to receive him as a novice. Now go to page 19, the beginning of chapter 5. Some of my readers may imagine that my young man was a sickly, ecstatic, poorly developed creature, a pale, consumptive dreamer. On the contrary, Alyosha was at this time a well-grown, red-cheeked, clear-eyed lad of 19, radiant with health. He was very handsome, too, graceful, moderately tall, with hair of a dark brown, with a regular, rather long, oval-shaped face and wide-set, dark gray, shining eyes. He was very thoughtful and apparently very serene. I shall be told, perhaps, that red cheeks are not incompatible with fanaticism and mysticism. But I fancy that Alyosha was more of a realist than anyone. Oh, no doubt, in the monastery, he fully believed in miracles. But to my thinking, miracles are never a stumbling block to the realist. So from time to time, the narrator is going to give us his opinion about things. And he's a surprisingly astute. Yeah. He says it is not miracles that dispose realists to believe. The genuine realist, if he's an unbeliever, will always find strength and ability to disbelieve in the miraculous. See, and that's true. You know, for the moment, you could convince a non-believer with a miracle. But he'll start doubting it as soon as his back is turned, you know, and think, oh, that was coincidence. No. So this is what our narrator is telling us. And if he's confronted with a miracle as an irrefutable fact, he would rather disbelieve his own senses than admit the fact. Even if he admits it, he admits it as a fact of nature till then unrecognized by him. Faith does not, in the realist, spring from the miracle, but the miracle from faith. See? So, if you have faith, miracles happen. If you're a realist, now this is how, well, how he's defining a realist. See? A realist is someone who's open to the real. And so if you have faith, miracles will happen. And it's not the other way around. If the realist once believes, then he's bound by his very realism to admit the miraculous also. The Apostle Thomas said that he would not believe till he saw. But when he did see, he said, my Lord and my God. Was it the miracle that forced him to believe? Most likely not. But he believed solely because he desired to believe, and possibly he fully believed 
in his secret heart, even when he said, I do not believe till I see. So these things we need to ponder, you know, because they are uh, interesting and paradoxical and wise. And then on page 20, I shall be told perhaps that Alyosha was stupid, undeveloped, had not finished his studies and so on. That he did not finish his studies is true. But to say that he was stupid or dull would be a great injustice. I'll simply repeat what I've said above. He entered upon this path only because at that time it alone struck his imagination and presented itself to him as offering an ideal means of escape for his soul from darkness to light. Add to that that he was to some extent a youth of our last epoch. So he's modern, is what he's being told. You know, he's not old-fashioned. That is, honest in nature, desiring the truth, seeking for it and believing in it, and seeking to serve it at once with all the strength of his soul, seeking for immediate action and ready to sacrifice everything but life itself for it. Though these young men unhappily fail to understand that the sacrifice of life is in many cases the easiest of all sacrifices. And that to sacrifice, for instance, five or six years of their seething youth to hard and tedious study, if only to multiply tenfold their powers of serving the truth and the cause they've set before them as their goal, such a sacrifice is utterly beyond the strength of many of them. So he's saying that dying for something is relatively easy, but Studying hard and working hard for five years um, is not easy. The path that Alyosha chose was a path going in the opposite direction, but he chose it with the same thirst for swift achievement. So he's not rebelling against things as these other young men are, but he's got that same desire for swift achievement. As soon as he reflected seriously, he was convinced of the existence of God and immortality. And at once, he instinctively said to himself, I want to live for immortality, and I will accept no compromise. In the same way, if he had decided that God and immortality did not exist, he would at once have become an atheist and a socialist. For socialism is not merely the labor question. It's before all things the atheistic question, the question of the form taken by atheism today, the question of the Tower of Babel built without God, not to mount to heaven from earth, but to set up heaven on earth. Alyosha would have found it strange and impossible to go on living Excuse me. I'm going to have the rest of that sentence so you can finish that up by yourself. <laughs> All right. Now, what I want you to see is that charming and delightful as Alyosha is, if he went on this way without falling to the earth and dying, if he were not killed, so to say, and crucified and reborn, he would be a hopeless romantic. I think we're given clues to that, despite the fact that we're told that he is healthy and vigorous and very manly. But now look on page 24. Among us there is sin, injustice, and temptation. But yet somewhere on earth there is someone holy and exalted. Now this is what Alyosha thinks and knows and is glad about. He has the truth. So Alyosha's been looking for this person, you see. He has the truth. He knows the truth. 
so it's not dead upon the earth, so it will come one day to us too and take over all the earth according to the promise. Now this is the dream in his heart. Alyosha knew that this was just how the people felt about Father Zosima and even reasoned. He understood it, but that the elder Zosima was the saint and custodian of God's truth, of that he had no more doubt than the weeping peasants and the sick women who held out their children to the elder. The conviction that after his death, the elder would bring extraordinary glory to the monastery and even stronger in Alyosha than in anyone there was even stronger. And of late, a kind of deep flame of inner ecstasy burnt more and more strongly in his heart. He was not at all troubled at this, his elders standing as a solitary example before them. Now, read this part carefully. No matter. He is holy. He carries in his heart the secret of renewal for all that power which will at last establish truth on the earth. And all men will be holy and love one another. And there will be no more rich nor poor, no exalted nor humbled, but all will be as the children of God and the true kingdom of Christ will come. That was the dream in Alyosha's heart. All right, it's too easy, isn't it? And we would see if we look closely enough at it that Alyosha, like the other brothers, is the victim of over-idealization, of abstraction, that if this is not brought down to earth, and if he doesn't see how hard it is, see, he thinks it's easy. He thinks as soon as his elder dies, that all of this grace will change the world immediately. That all people will love each other, and everything will be harmonious. And we'll have world peace. <laughs> and so we realize as readers you know we think at first all right Dostoevsky means us to think this is good but he doesn't he means us to see this would lead you to destruction you see because it can't come about it's an idealism it can't come about it comes out comes about very with great difficulty one by one hard work. And Alyosha has no notion of that. So, we see then that that except a grain of wheat fall to the earth and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. So we're going to see that all the brothers, all three of the brothers, are going to be crucified. You know, they're going to be hurt badly. And those ideals they have, you know, which are noble in themselves, because that's a noble uh, dream. But it is a dream. And if there is any one thing that Dostoevsky is against, it's that kind of illusion, that kind of dream. Now, not the sort of dream you have when you sleep, but the kind of dream you have when you idealize everything and make it prettier than it could ever be on this flawed but precious earth. So Alyosha then, like his other two brothers, is an idealist, and he has an idea. And it's an idea that has to be tested and changed, crucified. He has to suffer, and he will. Now his suffering will be brief. It won't be as long as that of Dmitri or Yvonne, but it is a terrible suffering. And so if we, when we read through that and see what he has to go through, uh, we will understand that, it, that he could have been lost in it. See, when, when one really falls to the earth and dies, one could be lost. It's not guaranteed, you know, that you can pick yourself up. And so what Dostoevsky is saying is, we all have to be, it's not just tested, but it's that the old person in us 
let's die. You know, and we have to start over. And so that pattern is throughout this novel in the, the death of the old Karamazov. You know, St. Paul, as I said, talks about the old man that was God. That sinful, terrible, disgraceful self. And then the new man uh, can be healed. We want to pay particular attention to the character of Ivan. And here's a little clue, it seems to me, that we need to pay attention to. He was extremely interested in his brother Ivan. Now this he is Alyosha. But when the latter had been two months in the town, when Ivan had been two months in the town, though they had met fairly often, they were still not intimate. Now these are the full brothers. They had the same mother and the same father. Alyosha, this is gonna roar. How do we turn it down? Just a little. Alyosha was naturally silent and he seemed to be expecting something, ashamed about something. See, he's embarrassed in front of his older brother and he admires his older brother. While his brother Ivan, though Alyosha noticed at first that he looked long and curiously at him, seemed soon to have left off thinking of him. Alyosha noticed with some embarrassment he ascribed this, his brother's indifference at first to the disparity of their age and education. But he also wondered whether the absence of curiosity and sympathy in Ivan might be due to some other cause entirely unknown to him. Now, what I think the narrator is telling us here is that Ivan is preoccupied. He's abstracted. He's thinking about something all the time. He's trying to work something out because he is a person of ideas and he loves his brother Alyosha, but he's preoccupied with an idea. And what he wants to do with his brother Alyosha, as you'll see when you read the Grand Inquisitor section, is to take him away from Zosima. I won't give you up to Zosima, he says. He doesn't want him to be a believer. He wants his baby brother to have the same doubts that he has and the same rebellion. So all of this passage through here, you just might read carefully because the clues that our narrator gives us uh, about the different characters are important. Now go on over to page 32. This is after they have decided to meet in the elder's cell because Dimitri and his father are in love with the same girl, or at least the father's lusting after her. It turns out that Dimitri really loves her. You know, we find out in the latter part of the novel. But at any rate, they're at each other's throats. And so they decide to meet in the elder's cell. And Alyosha is terrified because he's afraid that his father will play the buffoon, which he does, you know, and that he will be embarrassed and that he will insult the elder. So on page 32, in Father Zosima's cell, now you remember the other cell that we saw of uh, Tihon's, when Stavrogin goes to visit Tihon. Remember that this, the uh, room was filled, the private room was filled with beautiful works of art from all over the world of different religions and um, it showed an eclectic taste. Now is that what we have here or is there something different here? The cell was not very large and had a faded look. It contained nothing but the most necessary furniture of course and poor quality. There were two pots of flowers in the window and a number of holy pictures in the corner. 
before one huge ancient icon of the Virgin, a lamp was burning. Near it were two other holy pictures in shining settings, and next them, carved cherubim, china eggs, a Catholic cross of ivory with a Mater Dolorosa embracing it, and several foreign engravings from the great Italian artists of past centuries. Next to these costly and artistic gravings, next to these costly and artistic engravings, were several of the roughest Russian prints of saints and martyrs, such as are sold for a few farthings at all the fairs. On the other walls were portraits of Russian bishops, past and present. All right, this is a humbler abode. It's poverty that is shown forth to us. The furniture is not good. It's second-hand furniture, but he has a few precious things, but they too are eclectic. There's a Catholic cross, you see, and um, as well as icons and Russian prints of saints and martyrs from the poor, from the folk are gathered up here. So on the whole, now maybe you can analyze that a little better than I'm doing at this moment, but uh, it just seems to me that what we're being shown is the abode of a very humble person who values poverty and yet has a few things that apparently have been given to him that are precious. But it shows no fanatic. It shows no person who sticks to one line of thought entirely, but he embraces the whole world. All right, go on to page 36. All right, Alyosha has been afraid that his old father would act badly, and sure enough, of course, he does. He got up and, throwing up his hands, declaimed, Blessed be the womb that bore thee, and the paps that gave thee suck. The paps especially. When you said just now, don't be ashamed of yourself, for that's at the root of it all. And that's what the elder had said to the old man. You know, don't be so ashamed of yourself. Because that's why you're showing off. That's why you're being a buffoon. And now he's saying, you pierced right through me by that remark and read me to the core. Indeed, I always feel when I meet people that I'm, that I'm lower than all and that they all take me for a buffoon. So I said, hey, let me really play the buffoon. I'm not afraid of your opinion, for you're every one of you worse than I am. That's why I'm a buffoon. It's from shame, great elder, from shame. It's simply oversensitiveness that makes me rowdy. If I'd only been sure that everyone would accept me as the, the kindest and wisest of men, oh Lord, what a good man I should have been. Teacher, he fell suddenly on his knees. What must I do to gain eternal life? So he's being, you know, he is really being a buffoon and playing a role, you know, and suddenly falling on his knees in front of the elder, and this elder has always been treated with such great dignity, you know, that it's tremendously shocking. It was difficult even now to decide whether he was joking or really moved. The father Zosima, lifting his eyes, looked at him and said with a smile, you've known for a long time what you must do. You have sense enough. Don't give way to drunkenness and incontinence of speech. Don't give way to sensual lust, and above all, to the love of money. And close your taverns. If you can't close all of them, at least two or three. And above all, don't lie. You mean about Diderot? Because he's been telling all these tall tales, these silly tales that he embellishes. And the elder says, no, not about Diderot. Above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to such a pass that he can't distinguish the truth. And see, that's the terrible thing about lying, is finally, you know, you do get to where you lie to yourself, and then finally to the p position where one doesn't know the difference between the lie and the truth. 
And so one perverts one's own inner sense of truth by constantly lying to oneself. And so having no respect, he ceases to love. And in order to occupy and distract himself without love, he gives way to passions and coarse pleasures. Now look at the analysis here. See, the old man, old Karamazov, you know, I really like him. <laughs> he, that he's bright, he's intelligent, you know, he's got a sense of humor. And he's disgusting, you know. <laughs> but he's disgusting because he has all this energy and he hasn't used it well in life and he doesn't know what to do with himself. And he turns to lust because he doesn't know how to love. And because he's lied to himself. And so I think Dostoevsky means us to see him with compassion. You know? He's disgusting, as I say, and he's brutal and terrible. But he's human. And finally, at the end, aren't we meant to say, I too am a Karamazov? You know? I too find in myself an echo of this silliness and foolishness and sin and lying. So, all from continual lying to other men and to oneself, the man who lies to himself can be more easily offended than anyone. You know, it's sometimes very pleasant to take offense, isn't it? A man may know that nobody has insulted him, but that he's invented the insult for himself has lied and exaggerated to make it picturesque, has caught at a word and made a mountain out of a molehill. He knows that himself, yet he will be the first to take offense and will revel in his resentment till he feels great pleasure in it and so pass to genuine vindictiveness. But get up, sit down, I beg you. All this too is deceitful posturing. So the elder is not insulted, you know, he's not thinking, how dare you act this way in my presence, you know. But he sees through to the heart of it, and he talks to him honestly. And you have the feeling that he's kind of fond of him, even. So he's not putting him outside the human race, and that is what we do so many times to people. But finally then the elder knows that he must go outside because there are peasant women that have come a long distance to see him and to get his advice. And now this is one of the most important parts of the novel. Page 40. And this will tell us ever so much without directly stating it. But there is one from afar. He pointed to a woman by no means old, but very thin and wasted, with a face not merely sunburned, but almost blackened by exposure. She was kneeling and gazing with a fixed stare at the elder. There was something almost frenzied in her eyes. From afar off, Father, from afar off, from two hundred miles from here, from afar off, Father, from afar off, the woman began in a sing-song voice, as though she were chanting a dirge swaying her head from side to side with her cheek resting in her hand. And then the narrator tells us there is silent and long-suffering sorrow to be met with among the peasantry. It withdraws into itself and is still. But there's a grief that breaks out. And from that minute it bursts into tears and finds vent in wailing this is a particularly common, this is particularly common with women. But it's no lighter a grief than the silent. Lamentations comfort only by lacerating the heart still more. So he says there are two kinds of grief you'll encounter among, encounter among the peasants and among people who have to bear heavy loads all the time with no cessation. And one is a silence, a kind of stoic silence and the other is a wailing and lamentations. And you can't say that the wailing grief is any 
less heavy than the silent grief. Such grief, he says, does not desire consolation. It feeds on the sense of its hopelessness. Lamentations that spring only from the constant craving to reopen the wound. See, not to move on beyond the wound, not to move on beyond the suffering. And this is what those who are really downtrodden, that we are so sheltered from ever seeing, you know, in a technological society. But they're there. <laughs> You're of the tradesman class, said Father Zosima, looking curiously at her. Town folk we are, Father, town folk. Yet we're peasants, though we live in the town. I've come to see you, Father. We heard of you, Father, we heard of you. I've buried my little son, and I've come on a pilgrimage. I've been in three monasteries, but they told me, go, Nastasia, go to them. That's to you. I've come. I was yesterday at the service, and today I've come to you. What are you weeping for? It's my little son. I'm grieving for Father. He was three years old. Three years old. All but three months. For my little boy, Father. I'm in anguish for my little boy. He was the last one left. We had four, my Nikita and I. And now we've no children. Our dear ones have all gone. I buried my first three without grieving over much. And now I've buried the last. I can't forget him. He seems always standing before me. He never leaves me. He's withered my heart. I look at his little clothes, his little shirt, his little boots, and I wail. I lay out all that's left of him, all his little things. I look at them and wail. I say, now the key to my husband, let me go on a pilgrimage, Master. He's a driver. We're not poor people, Father, not poor. He drives our own horse. It's all our own, the horse and the carriage. And what good is it all to us now? My Nikita has begun drinking while I'm away. He's sure to. It used to be so before. As soon as I turn my back, he gives way to it. But now I don't think about him. It's three months since I left home. I've done. I've forgotten him. I've forgotten everything. I don't want to remember. And what would our life be now together? I've done with him. I've done. I've done with them all. I don't care to look upon my house and my goods. I don't care to see anything at all. Listen, Mother, said the elder. Once in olden times, a holy saint saw in the temple a mother like you weeping for her little one, her only one, whom God had taken. Knowest thou not, said the saint to her, how bold these little ones are before the throne of God. Verily, there are none bolder than they in the kingdom of heaven. Thou didst give us life, O Lord, they say, and scarcely have we looked upon it, but thou didst take it back. And so boldly they ask and ask again that God gives them at once the rank of angels. Therefore, said the saint, thou too, O mother, rejoice and weep not, for thy little one is with the Lord in the fellowship of the angels. That's what the saint said to the weeping mother of old. He was a great saint, and he could not have spoken falsely. Therefore, you too, mother, know that your little one is surely before the throne of God, is rejoicing and happy and praying to God for you. And therefore, weep not, but rejoice. The woman listened to him, looking down with her cheek in her hand. She sighed deeply. Manikita, tried to comfort me with the same words as you. Foolish one, he said, why weep? Our son is no doubt singing with the angels before God. He says that to me, but he weeps himself. And then Father Zosima, in his empathy, seems to see that there is no comfort for this woman. See, I think that first attempt that Father Zosima made was a kind of standard attempt. It was made with a tender heart. But it isn't the right answer. And he sees that. And then so he says to her, be not comforted. You know, and this is what people who are grieving want to hear. Don't be comforted. Consolation is not what you need. Weep. And be not consoled, but weep. 
Only every time that you weep, be sure to remember that your little son is one of the angels of God, that he looks down from there at you and sees you and rejoices at your tears and points at them to the Lord God. And a long while yet will you keep that great mother's grief, but it will turn in the end into quiet joy. And your bitter tears will be only tears of tender sorrow that purifies the heart and delivers it from sin. And I shall pray for the peace of your child's soul. What was his name? Alexei, Father. A sweet name. After Alexei, the man of God, his father. What a saint he was. I'll remember him, Mother. And your grief and my prayers, and I'll pray for your husband's help. It's a sin for you to leave him. Now look, here's the, see, he's, he, first of all, he said, don't, he tried the standard kind of, though he meant it, but he, the standard kind of consolation of saying, your little one is with God, he's happy, he's singing with the angel, and that should comfort you. And then he realizes, no, don't be comforted. You know, go ahead and grieve, don't be comforted. And then he moves on to the next step when he tells her it's a sin for you to leave your husband. So he's not going to be like Mishkin. And he's going to tell her, you have to go home. Your little one will see from heaven that you've forsaken his father and will weep over you. Why do you trouble his happiness? He's living for the soul, for the soul lives forever. And though he's not in the house, he's near you, unseen. How can he go into the house when you say that the house is hateful to you? To whom is he to go if he finds you not together, his father and his mother? He comes to you in dreams now, and you grieve. But then he will send you gentle dreams. Go to your husband, mother. Go this very day. I will go, Father. At your word, I will go. You've gone straight to my heart. My Nikita, my Nikita, you're waiting for me. And the woman began in a sing-song voice, but the elder had already turned away to a very old woman dressed like a dweller in the town, not like a pilgrim. Her eyes showed that she had come with an object, and in order to say something, she, she said she was the widow of a non-commissioned officer and lived close by in the town. Her son, Vasinka, was in the commissariat service and had gone to Ikuts in Siberia. He had written twice from there, but now a year had passed since he had written. She did inquire about him, but she did not know the proper place to inquire. Well, she goes on to say, someone told me that if I'd say the prayers for the dead, that he would write to me, that it would trouble him and he would write to me. And the elder says, don't think of it. It's shameful to ask the question, how is it possible to pray for the peace of a living soul? And his own mother, too, it's a great sin, akin to sorcery. So it's as though you are practicing magic. Sorcery. Only for your ignorance it is forgiven you. Better pray to the Queen of Heaven, our swift defense and help for the good help that she may forgive you for your error. And another thing I'll tell you, either he will soon come back to you, your son, or he'll be sure to send a letter. So he has a kind of second sight. He makes prophecies every now and then. And so he tells her that your son is either coming home or you're going to get a letter from him. Go and henceforward be in peace. Your son is alive, I tell you. All right, now this is not like either the advice given by Mishkin or quite like that given by Tehom. So we've got to think about what Dostoevsky is doing with Tehom. I don't want to believe that Tehom is meant to be lacking in anything, but he's a different kind of holy man, and he's in a very different situation. And Father Zosima comforts these women with the truth and tells them what they must do, what they ought to do. But I, I think that we need to remember that 
be not comforted. No, don't be comforted. When you've lost someone dear to you, and the whole world tries to make you forget about it, you know, and to turn to something that will divert you, and you want, at least for a while, to grieve, and you don't want to be comforted. So go on to page 43 now, in the middle. And there's a woman that says, I'm a widow these three years. She began in a half whisper with a sort of shudder. I had a hard life with my husband. He was an old man. He used to beat me cruelly. He lay ill. I thought looking at him, if he were to get well, if he were to get up again, what then? And then the thought came to me and the elder stops her. Stop. See, she's about to say, as we can tell, that she murdered her husband. And he stops her. And he put his ear close to her lips. The woman went on in a low whisper, so that it was almost impossible to catch anything. She had soon done. Three years ago, asked the elder, three years. At first I didn't think about it, but then I'd begun to be ill. And the thought never leaves me. Have you come from far? Over 300 miles away. Have you told it in confession? I've confessed it. Twice I've confessed it. Have you been admitted to communion? Yes. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to die. And now listen to this. Do you hear he speak with authority? Fear nothing. And never be afraid. And don't fret. If only your penitence fail not, God will forgive all. There is no sin, and there can be no sin on all the earth, which the Lord will not forgive to the truly repentant. Man cannot commit a sin so great as to exhaust the infinite love of God. Can there be a sin which could exceed the love of God? Think only of repentance, continual repentance, but dismiss fear altogether. Believe that God loves you as you cannot conceive, that he loves you with your sin, in your sin. It's been said of old that over one repentant sinner there is more joy in heaven than over ten righteous men. Go and fear not. Be not bitter against men. Be not angry if you're wronged. And then look at this. This is the key. This is the kernel. Forgive the dead man. See, this is the key to it. Forgive the dead man. She's been still harboring this terrible grudge and grief against the man who abused her. And so she can't ever be free until she moves on from that. Forgive the dead man in your heart. What wrong he did you. Be reconciled with him in truth. If you're penitent, you love. And if you love, you are of God. All things are atoned for. All things are saved by love. If I, a sinner, even as you are, am tender with you and have pity on you, how much more of God. Love is such a priceless treasure that you can redeem the whole world by it and expiate not only your own sins but the sins of others. He signed her three times with the cross, took from his own neck a little icon and put it upon her. She bowed down to the earth without speaking. Now, here is tremendously important part of all this interview because it's going to be crucial later on in the novel though it's hidden he got up and looked cheerfully at a healthy peasant woman with a tiny baby in her arms five miles you've dragged yourself with the baby what do you want I've come to look at you I've been to you before or have you forgotten you've no great memory if you've forgotten me they told us you were ill Thinks I, I'll go see him for myself. And now I see you, and you're not ill. 
You live another 20 years, God bless you. There are plenty to pray for you. How should you be ill? I thank you for all, daughter. By the way, she says, I have a thing to ask. Not a great one. Here are 60 kopecks. Give them, dear father, to someone poorer than me. I thought as I came along, better give through him. He'll know whom to give to. All right, now this is hidden in this middle of the novel. But it's my theory that this refutes Ivan's argument through the Grand Inquisitor. We'll have to talk about the Grand Inquisitor next time. But what the Grand Inquisitor maintains is that people are so weak and so fallible that they have to be taken care of. They can't take care of themselves. And they don't really know right from wrong anyhow. And so we have to have a Grand Inquisitor, a benevolent dictator, that in the name of the church takes away people's freedom gives them permission to sin and tells them what to do. And so this is Yvonne's picture of what has to be done with human beings. And if you'll think about it, and we must talk about it next time, it leads straight into state socialism, it seems to me, because it seems to me that Grand Inquisitor is not really a picture of a church man. But Yvonne has created it with the idea that wasn't yet anywhere around him, but that we saw in the 20th century with the dictators that seem to be benevolent, that take care of people because poor, weak human beings can't take care of themselves. Somebody has to tell them what to do. And so what, what Dostoevsky has done is plant in his novel, and most readers miss it. Most of the critics have not seen this as an answer to the Grand Inquisitor. But you see, if you could name for me anything stronger than this woman, this present woman, who has dragged herself all this way carrying a baby to give him something, see, not to take, because he helped her before. And so now she has come with you know, just some kopecks, which are not very much, but she thinks he'll know who to give them to. He, he will know who needs them. And so the resilience and the strength of people, uh, Dostoevsky has quietly shown them, and it's, but it's hidden in the workings of the novel, and not very many people have noticed it. All right, now, before we leave, we have a little more time. Mm -hmm. After he leaves these peasant women, he leaves this one that you know, he's been giving out. And he leaves this woman, that sturdy woman that has brought him something. Then he turns to this woman of little faith, as she's called, Madame Kochbatov, who is Lisa's mother. And page 47. She says to him, you know, that she's been reading books that have put ideas in her head. And did you recognize which book it was that she'd read? She said about burdocks growing on a grave. <laughs> so she's been reading Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. You know. So what if all there is, you see, is just those little flowers growing on your grave after you die? And how can we know? How can we be sure? She says. She says, how can I convince myself? Oh, how unhappy I am. I stand and look about me and see that scarcely anyone else cares. No one troubles his head about it. And I'm the only one who can stand it. It's deadly. Deadly. And then on page 48, he says, Father she says, how can I prove it? And he says, there's no proving it, though you can be convinced of it. And she means of immortal life. And she says, how? And then this is the heart of the book. He says, by the experience of active love. Strive 
to love your neighbor actively and indefatigably. And as far as you advance in love, you will grow surer of the reality of God and of the immortality of your soul. If you attain to perfect self-forgetfulness in the love of your neighbor, then you will believe without doubt, and no doubt can possibly enter your soul. And then he says, this has been tried. This is sure. So he's speaking from experience. This has been tried. This is sure. All right, then he's going to say more about it. He says, and she says, in active love, now there's another question, and such a question. You see, I so love humanity that, would you believe it, I often dream of forsaking all that I have, leaving Lisa and becoming a sister of mercy. I close my eyes and think and dream, and at that moment I feel full of strength to overcome all obstacles. No wounds, no festering sores could at that moment frighten me. I would bind them up and wash them with my own hands. I would nurse the afflicted. I would be ready to kiss such wounds. And Father Zosima says, it is much and well that your mind is full of such dreams and not others. See, if you're going to dream, <laughs> then it's nice to dream good dreams, you know. Sometimes, oh, and this is the crushing. Look at this next sentence. Mm. Sometimes, unawares, you may do a good deed in reality. <laughs> but she doesn't get it. You see, she just keeps on. She says, yes, but could I endure such a life for long? The lady went on fervently, almost frantically. That's the chief question. That's my most agonizing question. I shut my eyes and ask myself, would you persevere long on that path? And if the patient whose wounds you're washing did not meet you with gratitude, but worried you with his whims without valuing or remarking your charitable services, began abusing you and rudely commanding you and complaining to the superior authorities of you, which often happens when people are in great suffering, what then? Would you persevere in your love or not? And do you know I came with horror to the conclusion that if anything could dissipate my love for humanity, it would be ingratitude. In short, I'm a hired servant. I expect my payment at once, and that is praise and the repayment of love with love. Well, she's pretty uh, acute at analyzing herself, and we're going to see her more in this novel, and we realize she's not a bad woman at all, and I don't know quite how she does turn out. But she's acute and aware of things. And sometimes her judgment is good. She was in a very paroxysm of self-castigation. And concluding, she looked with defiant resolution at the elder. And the elder said, it's just the same thing the doctor told me. And he told me that he could love humanity in general but couldn't stand people. And she says on page 49, but what's to be done? Must one despair? And the elder's advice to Madame Holocaust then is straightforward. It's page 49, underline this. He says, above all, avoid falsehood. Now this is what he had told the old man, old Karamazov. Avoid being scornful, avoid fear. Don't be frightened over much, even of your own evil actions. I'm sorry I can say nothing more consoling to you. And now here's the part that you need to engrave on your consciousness. For love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared with love in dreams. Love in dreams is greedy for immediate action, rapidly performed and in the sight of all. Men will even give their lives if only the ordeal does not last long but is soon over, with all looking on and applauding as though on a stage. 
but active labor and fortitude. Active love is labor and fortitude. And for some people, too, perhaps a complete science. Now, you know, you have to think about that. Active love is labor and fortitude. And for some people, perhaps, a complete science. What does that mean? I've taken it over the years to mean that all right, love is not a feeling. And sometimes if you're going to if you're going to be serious about it, sometimes you have to study it and approach it as you would a branch of learning. That's what a science is. That it isn't just a nice fuzzy feeling. But it's an action. Love in action is different from love in dreams. And it has to be a conscious action. And it takes labor and fortitude. But I predict, he says, that just when you are with horror, when you see with horror, that in spite of all your efforts, you're getting further from your goal instead of nearer to it. At that very moment, I predict that you will reach it. See, now look what he's saying. You know, you, you keep trying to love, selflessly and actively, not in dreams, not expecting a reward. And you think, I'm making no progress, whatever. And he says, just when you realize that, that's when you will behold clearly the miraculous power of the Lord who has been all the time loving and mysteriously guiding you. So it's at the moment when you think, I'm going to give up on trying for myself because I've been working at this and I've gotten no closer to it, then it's at that moment that you see that a power greater than you has been doing it all along and that you can't do it. So this is the heart, as I say, of the novel. And this is the part that you have to keep thinking about and, and examining and putting it together with all the rest of the, the novel, the ordeals of the three boys, the uh, suffering that is undergone, the plight of the old man who still uh, seeks spiritual guidance. You know, he made up a reason to go to the elder's cell, but don't you think really he wanted to meet Father Zosima and get to know him? Because there's something in, there's a thirst in old Karamazov. He is human sin. You see, but human sin is still human. And so there's a thirst in him for holiness. And I think at the end of the novel, what you'll find is that the boys gather, the young boys gather around Alyosha and say, hurrah for Karamazov. So Karamazov is the fallen human race, beautiful and precious and vile and ugly, but capable still of love. All right, there were more passages that we ought to cover, and one of the most puzzling is that article that Yvonne has written saying that the church ought to become the state. The church needs to take over the state. Now, that is strange for Yvonne, who we know later on, we know really that he's, that he's I think he's been an atheist all along. I think he's never faced that fact in himself. He calls it rebelling against God, you see, because he doesn't approve of God's universe. He doesn't approve of his world. And so he wants to give back the ticket. I don't want a part of your world. I resign from it, is what he says. But I think it's because he doesn't really believe in God. 
But at any rate, what we know is that in Dostoevsky's world, Ivan is a secularist, a liberal, and the liberals in Europe were um, much more radical than we use than the ones for whom we use the term nowadays. And yet here he is saying that the whole state should become a church. And so it's very, very puzzling. I've worked with that all these years. And what I finally come up with, and I want you to be thinking about it and rereading that part, what I finally come up with is, I think that's what has happened in our day. More and more the state is taking over the moral standards and telling people what to do. And so more and more there's a piety that would go to faith that is being taken over by the state. Now I want you to read that and see if that's how you interpret it. Because I think we'll finally see a picture of it then in the Grand Inquisitor. See, the Grand Inquisitor is this benevolent dictator that pretends to be a church. But he's really a dictator. And so when you think about the totalitarianism of the 20th century and the thought control, see, that's what was thinking about then. We had tyranny. Before that time, we had terrible tyranny uh, in all of our history of every nation. But what we had in the 20th century were attempts at thought control so that what you think uh, became important in Russia under Stalin and in Germany. And then nowadays I think we see in our world that um, this whole, the whole issue of morality and realms that we had thought belonged either to the family or the church, now belong to the state. And the state is getting more and more moral, you know, sometimes in a very strange way, you know, because nowadays it seems that smoking a cigarette is the most immoral act you can do, you know, and it really is thought of morally. But we see more of that going on. And so what I want to say to you is this. If <coughs> What Yvonne is advocating, and, and the others are taking it on a different level, holy men are taking it on a different level, and they're saying, so be it, so be it, but they mean at the end of time, when history's complete, the ideal is that um, the religious body will be the whole thing at the end of time, and so they're on different levels. Yvonne and Father Zosima and others. But I would like your close analysis of this whole argument, this whole scene. Because the thing I want to ask you is this. If, if all this came about that he's talking about, then Father Zosima would have to turn the woman in that confessed that she murdered her husband. Do you see the significance of that? The church has always been, and all holy oh, bodies have always been, a refuge for the, the sinner, for the criminal. And there has to be some aspect of the human race that will not cast a person out of the human race. And so he hears her confession, he hears her telling him, it must be, you know, that she killed her husband because all the evidence seems there. Now, if he did what they want us to do nowadays, he would go to the authorities and turn her in. So I want you to be thinking, because the issue is a real one. And why would Yvonne be proposing that the church become the all in all? take over the state since he doesn't believe 
So there's something in his social reform program that he thinks would be served by this. So I'd like to hear some of you next time uh, talk about this section, and we'll be doing the Grand Inquisitor section also. Remember when you read the Grand Inquisitor section that it's Yvonne telling the story. It's not Dostoevsky. See, people lift that out of the novel and print it in textbooks, and they assume that it's Dostoevsky saying you have to choose between a gentle and ineffectual Christ or a powerful and benevolent dictator. That's not what's worth the same. That's his character in life. So, and that makes a great deal of difference. And so I'll, I'll be interested in hearing what you have to say, so I'll think about it.